dopamine feels great. Being in pursuit and motivated and craving things feels wonderful. What I'm trying to do today is to illustrate how dopamine works in your brain so that you can continue to engage in dopamine evoking activities. There are activities that we can do that will give us healthy, sustained increases in dopamine, both the peaks when they happen and to maintain or even increase our baseline levels of dopamine. So how do we do that? What are some of these activities? Well, in recent years, there's been a trend toward more people doing so-called cold exposure. In part, this was popularized by Wim Hof, the so-called Iceman, getting into cold showers, taking ice baths, exposing oneself to cold water of various kinds can, in fact, increase our levels of dopamine as well as the neuromodulator neuroepinephrine. This is not a new phenomenon. In the 1920s, a guy by the name of Vincent Prisnitz was one of the first people to popularize and formalize cold water therapies. He was an advocate of cold water exposure in order to boost the immune system and increase feelings of well-being. And actually, this practice dates back long before uh, Vincent's popularized it. And Wim Hof is the more recent iteration of this. First of all, some of the safety parameters. Let's, let's establish those first. Getting into very, very cold water, you know, 30 degree Fahrenheit or even low 40 degree Fahrenheit can put somebody into a state of cold water shock. I mean, people can die doing that. So obviously, you want to approach this uh, with some caution. But for most people, getting into 60 degree water, or 50 degree water, or if you're acclimated and comfortable with it, can have tremendously beneficial results on your neuromodulator systems, including dopamine. What temperature of water you can tolerate will depend on how cold water adapted you are and how familiar you are with the experience of getting into cold water. So the quickening of the breath, the widening of the eyes, the, the feeling as if you can't catch your breath, and even some physical pain at the level of the skin, that happens almost every time or every time that you get into cold water, even if you're cold water adapted. What almost everybody knows and understands is that that wall, as I like to refer to it, is coming. That's always the first experience of getting into cold water. There's no real way around that. Now, this study that I mentioned earlier, Human Physiological Responses to Immersion into Water of Different Temperatures, really interesting study that was done and published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology. It's a really interesting study. They looked at people getting exposed to water that was warm, moderately cold, or very cold. It was 32 degrees Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius, or 14 degrees Celsius. What they looked at were the concentrations of things like epinephrine and dopamine and so on. And what they found was really interesting. First of all, upon getting into cold water, the changes in adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine, were immediate and fast, and these were huge increases. So that's the getting into the cold water that everybody experiences, these huge increases in adrenaline. But then what was interesting is they observed that dopamine levels started to rise somewhat slowly and then continued to rise and reach levels as high as 2.5 times above baseline. That's a remarkably high increase. Remember, if we go back to our examples of chocolate, sex, a doubling above baseline, nicotine, two and a half times above baseline, the increase in dopamine from cold water exposure of this kind was comparable to what one sees from cocaine, except in this case, it wasn't a rise and crash. It was actually a sustained rise in dopamine took a very long time, up to three hours, to come back down to baseline, which is really remarkable. And I think this explains some of the positive mental and physical effects that people report subjectively after doing cold water exposure. One question that many of you are probably asking is, just how cold should the water be? Well, you could mimic what was done in this study and do 14 degrees Celsius, but for some people that won't be cold enough, for some people that will be too cold. They did look at the release of stress hormones like cortisol in addition to the release of things like epinephrine and adrenaline. And it's interesting that they noted that in all cases, but especially at that coldest temperature, there was an increase in cortisol, but that it was transient, that eventually people's cortisol, the stress hormone, subsided a bit. There are basically two different approaches to remaining in the cold when it's uncomfortable. One is to try and relax yourself, to try and practice slow breathing, to try and dilate your gaze. I've talked about this before in previous podcasts, to go into panoramic vision, to essentially try and calm yourself so that it's not as stressful in the cold. Other people, however, take the approach of trying to ramp up their level of internal autonomic arousal, meaning to get really energized and kind of lean into the friction of the cold, and they find that easier. To be totally honest, it does not matter for sake of dopamine release because the dopamine release is triggered and then continues even after you get out of the cold water. 
it's well established now that getting into cold water, whether or not it's a shower, an ice bath, circulating cold water, a stream, etc., that can evoke the norepinephrine release immediately and the long arc of that dopamine release. Why would that be good? Well, this does appear to raise the baseline of dopamine for substantial periods of time. And most people report feeling a heightened level of calm and focus after getting out of cold water. So cold water exposure turns out to be a very potent stimulus for shifting the entire milieu, the entire environment of our brain and body and allowing many people to feel much, much better for a substantial period of time after getting out of the ice bath or cold water of any kind than they did before. It's a basically zero cost. I mean, you need access to water of some sort, cold water, shower, etc. But basically zero cost way of triggering a long lasting increase in dopamine without ingesting anything, no pharmacology whatsoever. Please again, approach it with uh, safety and caution in mind, but it is a very potent stimulus. Again, 250% a, a rise in baseline, two and a half times rise in baseline rivals that of cocaine, which is really remarkable.